Um, welcome everyone also from me. Um, very nice to be here. I'm excited to, to hear the answers to uh, pretty interesting questions um, that we've prepared. And please, if you have further questions for the speakers, do type them in the chat uh, for the first you know, two thirds of the, the meeting when we go through um, pre um, pre questions. And then later when we get to the Q and A, um, I also encourage you to make sure that you speak up or again, type questions into the chat to make this really interactive and make sure that we're all engaged and get the most out of the meetup. So super excited to, to start. Um, I'll hand over first to Christoph maybe to introduce themselves and then maybe uh, Alexi, you can go after introduce yourself before we dive right into the questions. Yeah, sure. So thanks, Mona, for the introduction. I'm Christoph. I'm CFO of a company which is called Bidwala, and it has a product which now is called Nuri. Um, so we changed, um, pretty, we can talk about that later, um, our branding. Um, so not only colors and, and themes, but also the name. Uh, very exciting times. Um, actually, that happened yesterday. So, um, but a little bit more about myself. Um, I come from the traditional banking background, no surprise in the blockchain ecosystem. We find a lot of people um, who have worked in banking that has a reason. Uh, when I worked in banking, I saw a lot of flaws, really a lot of flaws. I worked in um, correspondent banking, trade finance, derivative markets during the financial crisis. So the whole breakdown of the market, the, the loss of trust between financial intermediaries and how problematic these financial intermediaries, these leveraged products, the intransparency, all of that was, was for me at that time already a gut feeling something is wrong here. It took until 2014, 15, when I was reading about uh, the, the blockchain and this thing behind Bitcoin, the thing you saw on TV with some nerds. And then it was like having this aha moment. This, okay, for sure, this is solving problems. A lot of those I saw it in, in, in daily business. And I was like, okay, that's not really something for me because this is an IT topic. And the IT guys in the bank, they will just do it, right? This is the back end, the back office, IT departments, they will pick it up and do something, especially, obviously, I thought in, um, in securities markets, the bank was very heavily involved in those. I thought in the future, securities will be somewhere on this blockchain. And um, yeah, and then they do it. So some years later, uh, um, I'm then moved myself to a corporate startup. So um, you already see I have a lot of personal energy and in a corporate setup, you cannot bring your whole energy into actual movement and translate that. So I went to a corporate startup first step. Um, and then uh, as Bidwala approached me, I already saw the banks are very, very slow. Even if they see that this technology is important for them, it's, uh, it's important for them to move um, um, their internal systems. It just takes, we talk decades, definitely decades about a transition like this to a revolutionary new technology. So, and then Bitwala approached me. I was already going into this startup direction. Um, they said, hey, we, we need someone for our new product. It will be a banking product. Um, they already had some founders, but I'm kind of the adopted co-founder who joined like three years ago, became CFO, so responsible for the banking and regulatory things. And yeah, also tax, finance, accounting, all, all of that. Um, it's a wild ride. Um, I moved to Berlin. Uh, I don't regret it one day. It's, it's awesome. Amazing. Thank you for that. Um, Alexi, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Mano. Um, yeah, so as Christoph, a uh, blockchain and crypto enthusiast, uh, so I'm managing director of Solaris Digital Asset, which is the digital asset unit of Solaris Bank. Uh, so Solaris Bank, it's a tech company with a banking license. We offer uh, API for everybody who wants to build financial services within their app. Uh, so really around the context of embedded finance. Uh, so on one hand, you know, you can offer a bank account uh, with a KYC service, a card or loan. And now with our digital asset unit, also include a crypto wallet uh, within uh, your offering or the option to buy and sell uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, yeah. So came to, to the crypto space roughly two to three years ago. Uh, it's been a very exciting journey. Uh, obviously there is day like yesterday where you know things are uh, moving like crazy in the crypto space. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, that's great to see um, partner like Bitvala who has been there uh, on the long run. Uh, and I think we share the same philosophies and like, you know, we are here to build and, uh, and to build great product for the, for the market on the, on the long term. Yeah, wow, both of you have very interesting stories, very interesting backgrounds, and I think perfect 
perfect backgrounds for the topic today in terms of cracking crypto custody. Um, so I'd love to dive right in and get all of the interesting facts from you. Um, I'll start with you, Christoph. Um, my first question would be, what makes a good user experience for crypto users? Yeah, I think that is obviously the main reason we have this, um, the, this meetup tonight with Alexis and me and the cooperation we are having. Um, if you think about the crypto space, um, there's, there's a lot of interest. A lot of people know yeah, Bitcoin, ETH, I, sh I should have something invested some years ago already. And then if, if people have this, yeah, they have this interest and they actually want to do it, they, they have a lot of hurdles. And, and some of them are UX driven. Um, the, the platforms out there, they're not customer friendly because of the heritage of, of crypto coming from 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 a background um, in, in which it was regulatory wise really hard to build a solution which um, um, which is applicable with a, with the banking system so we had to solve this first we had to build something which is on the safe side in, in terms of, um, of of regulatory and which is as close as possible as uh, as the feeling of going into your online banking, going to your bank account and buy an ETF savings plan or um, like a traditional, uh, a traditional investment product. So this was, I think, the first step to make this more accessible, to bring it into a used and well-known financial product, meaning a banking product and not telling people, yeah, you need to go to this exchange, which looks like if you trade on Xetra directly and has a black screen and move, the numbers are moving up and down and um, you don't know where to start. Like obviously this was a very important first step to bring people into that space and take the hurdles away to, um, to you make a very easy usable product in an, in an experience which everybody of us had always um, because everybody has a bank account, uh, at least in this country. And um, so check mark on this. But then the, the second problem is if you actually then go from this bank account, you have this on ramp, let's call it, then how do you get into crypto and how, so where, where is your crypto? Where is your cryptocurrency then stored? You have the money part solved with the bank account. Okay, but um, the blockchain is something revolutionary new. So there is not just an account. You cannot treat it like a, like a bank account. So if you talk about Bitcoin, Ethereum, these are blockchains and the ownership, your ownership of these assets when you buy them through our account, they are stored in something which is called a wallet. Um, and um, these concepts, they are, they are basically very deep in the technology of, of cryptocurrencies. We talk about private key and public key setups, which are the heart of the invention actually of how to move value on the blockchain from one party to another. And But that also means that there is a, something very, very new, a wallet and um, we have built our first product on this traditional world, uh, basically on the roots of the blockchain with a non-custodial wallet, meaning that you hold also these private keys, basically really the, the lock on the, uh, basically the, the key for the lock on the blockchain itself, you hold the key to move your funds on the blockchain itself. And we offered you in our first product iteration, uh, a wallet, which in which you had these keys uh, that has huge advantages because you have a direct ownership. Nobody else ever can seize your funds. Um, you are the only one uh, being able to move them, but it has all these huge downsides. Um, if you lose these keys, we all heard these stories, person A in, in England, uh, person B in the US, lost hundreds of Bitcoin, whatever. So these are the cases. What, what in the case, um, you want to you're passing on and what about the heritage like there's there's real issues with this concept that only one person has the private keys the owner um even with all the the advantages being being attached um and it also means uh, so first people are aware of these issues that people can lose keys so if you tell them now you get your keys and please write a phrase down they get this oh, I can lose something here. And again, like what I said at the beginning, this friction of going into crypto, so the, also the, the safety aspect is keeping just then at the end, a very end of the journey away. Um, so safety issues. And secondly, it's a really not so good UX because then you write down um, the, the, a seed phrase, you write down words, you need to store it somewhere. 
Um, that is obviously not fully digital. That is not how you open a PayPal account. A PayPal account, you open with an email address and a password. That's it. Um, and to be honest, I believe um, crypto has a huge market potential. Um, uh, we have seen that obviously and betted on that before the crypto hype um, of 2021. It always comes in circles. Uh, um, so mm. there is, there, there will be a, wi wi um, a way bigger audience for crypto, um, but only if this friction goes away. And um, so it was for us very important in our whole product to improve this wallet part, to move on and to build a better customer experience, which is basically you already have entered your email address, you have your username with us, and you have an, uh, you have a password. Why can you not unlock your crypto with those move your crypto. Um, I think that is the way to actually make this audience as wide as we all hope that it uh, becomes. And um, so we had to look out for solutions in the market. And um, I think now it's a good time to hand over to Alexis as well. Um, uh, Solar Digital Assets, Assets thankfully offered a really good solution for that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Christoph. Um, and in that regard, you know, that's exactly what we try to aim in that partnership at the end of the day is to make the user experience as easy as possible. Um, and I think, you know, uh, that's a very good example uh, of what you've been offering. And, you know, there is a market for uh, self-custody. I think for some of your users and like to enjoy the management of their own key. But as you mentioned, when it comes to the mass market and when it comes to driving uh, digital asset adoption uh, further, uh, for the first user, for the newbies, uh, a seamless experience uh, is a must. Uh, and a seamless experience, they need to also be trusted. And I think for that partnership, uh, that's exactly what we've uh, successfully uh, accomplished. And Alexi, on, on, on that note, um, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more on the difference between storing fiat funds, so, you know, money in the traditional sense versus storing crypto. Yeah, very good question, Mona. I think, you know, for us, that's something we are quite familiar with. And, you know, it's been very interesting to look at that because, you know, Solaris Bank core product is to offer bank account via our API. Uh, to partner. Um, and then we decided to add that crypto wallet uh, for our partner also to add that. Uh, so I would say, you know, let me start with, you know, what is similar and then maybe, you know, uh, jump into what is a little bit different. Um, so what is similar, I would say is at the end of the day, it's an account uh, where we, you have some type of value uh, in there for a specific asset. You can receive funds, you can send funds out uh, and, you know, for some regulatory requirement, uh, you have to do some type of monitoring uh, around that. Um, however, what's different is on one hand, you have to connect uh, to centralized party uh, with a lot of intermediaries in the middle. Uh, and you have to connect, for example, to the SEPA network on the Euro side, which is connected to the central bank um, versus on the crypto side for self-keeping crypto, you're offering a wallet, which is connected not only to one uh, network only, which is the SEPA network, but which can be connected to multiple uh, protocols, which are open, which are running 24-7, uh, and which are global. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, a very interesting uh, challenge uh, to look at, uh, and also which creates uh, an opportunity which is unique, right? Because that means that a lot of people are interacting on this network, which are global and which are open, uh, and you can send funds around 24 seven globally uh, with, uh, with this network. I think, you know, the key difference as well is as Christoph mentioned, right? It's all about self-keeping the private key. Uh, so maybe just in a nutshell, probably a lot of you in that audience are already familiar on how do you self-keep funds on the blockchain, but on one hand you have a private key and then from that you can derive a public key and then an address. And that private key is kind of like the equivalent you know, of your password, if you might simplify it, and then your email address will be your public keys and you can share with everybody to receive funds. So that private key needs to be safe keep you know, in a very secure way because if you sign a transaction by creating a digital signature and broadcasting that on the blockchain, this is final. There is no way you can revert that transaction, which is a bit different right, from the fiat world where when you do a transaction on the fiat world, you have another counterparty, another bank, then you know, and there is always, you know, an option to uh, recover the fund, which bring a very interesting point around security. Therefore, you know, your funds cannot be hacked uh, because then the funds will be lost uh, permanently. So I would say, you know, one of the 
key difference is really not saying that like, you know, on the banking side, things are, things are not secure. Uh, there's already a lot of security which are put in place on the on the banking side. However, on the crypto side, it's even to a higher level where you really have to think about different type of use case on how do you safe keep the funds uh, and how do you monitor uh, this fund. So yeah, that would be kind of like the, the main differences I would say. Okay, yeah, that is uh, it's, it's a very strong difference, I would say, and in a lot of respects, uh, very interesting. And I think in the sense of, or in the, on the topic of security might be a nice segue into the next uh, question for Christoph, which uh, is what is the difference actually between self-custody and a custodial wallet? And what would you say are the advantages and the disadvantages of each of those? You're still muted. <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 this, uh, uh, normal mistake. So um, yeah, um, I, I touched a little bit before already that that self custody is basically the the born solution with the blockchain. So this is um, the, the the traditional um, way. If you direct participant, let's say, um, of of this decentralized network, how how you are um, how you are interacting with your value um, stored on the blockchain. Um, um, so and um, it's I think for some use cases it's, it's also very useful if you um, if you if you're living in a country where you don't trust authorities and and you cannot trust even uh, central counterparties um, so this fully decentralized ownership and um, being only yourself um, the guardian of your keys and the, the the person to move the value um, you own on this blockchain that is a great feature. Um, it's also great if you are take, uh, participating um, in, in very innovative uh, solutions, like in the DeFi space, where you want to use a MetaMask browser and, and you want to do um, uh, decentralized um, activities, decentralized, use decentralized exchanges, etc. Then it's also helpful that you have direct access and you can basically integrate better in a, in a blockchain ecosystem, let, let's say. So there, there are advantages of self Custodianship, the um, the the two meme um, the the memes around it is be your own bank and um, not your keys, not your coins. So meaning if if you give away your key for convenience reasons, and then you are in the usual trade off because of between convenience and safety. So if you give away your keys, um, that is definitely um, like a solution we are now talking about more convenient. But it means that you trust again someone else, another counterparty, and even if it would be a triple A rated bank, it's still there is a risk that somebody potentially defaults or there's a fraud case or or whatever, and then you need to hope that you get your funds back. Um, normally, there are insurance schemes for that. There's uh, there's a lot of uh, safety guard, uh, and and guardianship of your assets, but still there's a rest uh, uh, of a, re a risk that um, that you lose your assets. Um, um, but if we go back to the self-custodian solution, the question is, are you yourself the more safe and secure um, custodian uh, of, your, of your private uh, uh, key phrase? Um, and there have been too many stories um, of people who had problems with that uh, and humans make errors. So um, the question really is if an institution, if it's a safe one, if we're talking about regulated entity is not perhaps for most users the better way to store the private keys with the intermediary than to be fully decentralized themselves. Yeah, I think that's a very good point that you are making, Christophe, here. Like, you know, you know, there is use case, I think, for both. And where are you in your journey around crypto and what is the exact use case that you want to use, right? Um, if you are newbies and you just get started and you are not 100% confident, you know, then like you understand the full consequences or you have the right measure in place, probably, you know, working with a company which is investing a lot in security and making your user experience is probably easier to get started. Um, if you are, you know, a crypto expert and you've been in the field, you know, as an early adopter and you know how to manage that, even though we've seen, you know, people, uh, you know, 
who were uh, early adopters and you know really uh, knowledgeable in the field uh, still you know losing access uh, to, to 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 some coin and also there is the topic around like you know there are people who have need for uh, custody of their fund like businesses for example or institutional investor right uh, because if you are an asset manager or if you are a company you probably don't want to be managing the fund on your own you probably want to rely on a third party to safety the fund so what is really exciting about i think uh, the blockchain is actually you have the choice you can decide you know to trust the counterparty and to uh, send them their fund or you can do uh, self custody as well so um, i think that choice is really uh, amazing uh, in that regard but, but um, so again, it, um, uh, what Alexis said, um, it, it depends very much what user of cryptocurrencies you are. And if you're living in an authoritarian, uh, authoritarian state, um, that can be a key feature to hold your private keys. Um, that this, the state um, who's perhaps introducing capital controls, devaluing currency, trying to force um, people who, who hold assets um, by by seizing the, their assets, um, so um, it's an that's it, it's, it's it's an important part of the of the whole Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptocurrency ecosystem to have this feature because too many states on the uh, on the uh, on this planet are are not run in a way in which in which your assets and and the ownership of assets is so ensured as in, in the one we are we have the um, uh, we we are able to live in and. So, um, yeah, um, I, for me as an enthusiast, it's also speaking a little bit to my soul, right? But again, um, in, in countries, um, in, uh, in, in well-regulated countries, uh, I would also say that customers are a little bit, sorry for the word, spoiled. I'm not finding a better one now. By this safety, their, their environment offers them. So the, the tooling they are using also for their financial activities um, is obviously optimized for intermediaries and, and for an easy flow instead of this taking more personal responsibility. And then, as I said before, in the trade-off, you obviously move away from the convenience part. And uh, so since people are a little bit um, spoiled with convenience, we are talking here about our product in this, in this meetup. We are based in Germany. We are active throughout the European Union. I would say a custody solution is nearly a must. To, to offer more people um, uh, these investment opportunities. Very interesting. And I think we can all really relate to the trade-off between convenience and safety in, in a lot of uh, our, our live situations. Uh, so it's a, it's a very nice analogy. I think it makes it very clear. Um, Pablo, actually one of our um, attendees had a question, which I will read out to you. Um, he's asking, in case of a custody solution, does it mean custody provider stores all value on their wallet? Does it have a risk of potential concentration of value in the hands of big custody providers? I would say this is um, this is a question to Alexis mostly. Um, I will say one thing to it. Um, so if you look at the traditional markets like shares, securities, there are high concentrations because of the huge economies of scale. So if you look at where you're, um, if you have an ETF portfolio, whatever, where this actually is stored, very often it's not the bank account you're interacting with. Like for example, if you have a Sparkasse account, Dika Bank is the bank who is the custodian of, or of your, of your um, shares and securities because they basically, there was a lot of mergers going on, BNP Paribas, State Street, HSBC, they are owning like five providers are owning 80% of the not owning but they are custodian of assets in these traditional securities markets um, and they are not owning them on the balance sheet it's off balance sheet um, um, but they are the ones basically taking care of these for the customers yeah. and happy to to comment on that as well uh, so i think that was a very good question that you're asking uh, and when you look at the property of the blockchain there's different things to take into consideration right for example, you know, in terms of like potential too much concentration, what you have to look at is first of all, even if a custodian safe keep a lot of assets, that doesn't mean that they will obviously have an impact on the protocol itself. So for example, when you look at Bitcoin, you have a proof of work mechanism, right? Which is miner are mining uh, on the blockchain and the 
the custodian has nothing to do with that. They are just like safekeeping the private key and broadcasting transaction. Uh, so if you have too much concentration on the on the mining side of things, that could obviously be a problem because the network then could be uh, unsecure. However, you have different network though where your question is very valuable, right? Which are the kind of like next generation uh, blockchain where which are moving into proof of stake. Uh, meaning that like if you are safekeeping funds, uh, you know, uh, you will have with the assets and you hold uh, under custody, uh, you can potentially, you know, uh, take part of that. Uh, and here, I think, you know, it's a very interesting uh, question. However, there is, as Christoph mentioned, there is some economies of scale, which can be quite interesting. Uh, maybe on your own, you know, you are not able to take part of that value chain. However, in a pooled manner, you can then generate some yield on the assets that you will have because, you know, that a uh, larger institution is able to uh, give you some yield on this proof of stake uh, network. Uh, so, you know, there's always some trade off, uh, but also again, the huge advantage again of blockchain is if at some point in time you have some risk or, you know, you are not happy with a specific custodian, you can always transfer your funds out uh, at any moment of time to your own wallet or to another custodian wallet. And, you know, uh, obviously, you know, too much concentration is never a, a good thing. So hopefully we will see a healthy, uh, ecosystem with a lot of like you know great company uh, building in the in the space as well. Thanks. I think this really nicely relates. Actually, oh sorry, Christoph. I, mean, I, I wanted to add a point, but because obviously we've been talking now about a new world of assets with digital assets and and these blockchain based um, uh, ownership rights, and so the two, so there are huge advantages of those. Um, and um, so one of the disadvantages of the old world is. That these old shares and securities are really hard to move out of these custodian banks and out of, of these deposits and uh, because they are super undigital and there's highly manual processes uh, and that we improve massively with the custodianship of digital assets and, and, and crypto but it makes them yeah easier to move and um, so safety that the cyber security is a very very important feature and so there is a, a potential risk, yes, and a concentration risk because it's the, tip, the the honeypot uh, theme. So if the the bigger um, the bigger a potential reward for a hacker is, um, the bigger is this honeypot which is drawing uh, people um, to try it actually uh, towards it. So yes, there is a, there is a cyber risk, and um, I can say that in the in the due diligence process when we when we talked about uh, which crypto custodian do we want to work with for our product this was i would say the top the top topic we talked about and um the longest and the deepest um to actually to come together and find a solution where we feel the most comfortable with the assets of our customers this is a, again a very nice segue um to to another question for for alexis which is in a similar manner um, when it comes to storing actual crypto, what is meant with the dilemma between security and availability? Yeah, perfect. Uh, I can touch on that. I saw, so there was a question from, from Sasha, which kind of like touched a little bit on multi-sig and MPC. So that's a very nice uh, uh, segue into that. Uh, okay. So yeah, in, in crypto, you know, when we, when we start, like when, you know, we started to look at that roughly like, you know, three to four years ago, there was that entire topic, you know, uh, around core storage or deep core storage, uh, warm and hot. Uh, so what does it mean, right? If you have your keys online, uh, they are hot. Um, it is a hot wallet. Uh, if you have your key fully offline, uh, they are uh, on the core storage. Um, and, you know, there are use cases uh, for both. Let's say, you know, uh, you want to just park I don't know, 10 million euro of Bitcoin in a very, very secure way. and You don't plan to touch it for the next uh, 50 years. You know, maybe you can put them in a, in a bunker under the Swiss Alp. Uh, and that's probably, you know, uh, the most secure way. However, if you want to make use of this asset or trade them on a daily basis or make some payment with it, probably not ideal uh, for you. And here back in the day, we've seen you can kind of like an evolution of the technology where it started with just like, you know, some regular hot wallet where you safe keep the key on an online uh, server, but then you have a single, um, a single, um, single point of failure, uh, if you might say so. So if you hack the key, you know, someone can trigger a transaction. Um, and then there was an evolution which was bringing multi-sig 
uh, on the network where actually your keys, uh, you will need multiple approvers, so a scheme of M out of N, for example, uh, for you to be able uh, to transact. Here, the challenge, and we've seen with multisig, is it's not supported by all blockchain natively. Uh, so when you want to scale your processes, so for example, on Bitcoin, it is, but not on all uh, blockchains, so for example. And that was a huge challenge that we've seen more and more protocol uh, you know, uh, growing. And also what you have to keep in mind is also in terms of like signing a transaction, for example, on the Bitcoin, you might have heard, you know, then you have uh, fees and you have to pay. If you use a multi-sig uh, process, this would be more expensive. Um, so what happened is there was new way to safe keep your assets, uh, which is one which is called uh, Secret Shamir Secret, uh, sorry, C C uh, Secret Shamir, and the other one, which is called MPC a multi-party computation or threshold signature. And the huge advantage uh, that these two technology has brought, on one hand, you know, you can split the key. Therefore, you don't have that uh, single point of failure with a uh, secret chamber. Uh, but the one challenge on that one is now you have to reconstruct the key. And again, you have that single point of failure. And now, which is quite considered the industry standard in that regard, with its MPC uh, or threshold signature which means that at no point in time, there was ever a single point of failure. So you have like free, uh, or for example, free um, uh, cryptographic material. Uh, and to be able to sign a transaction, you will do some com mathematical uh, computation, which will enable you to create a digital signature without ever colluded, uh, colluding with uh, any of the material. And that's what we, we are using on our side. And we see the market moving into that direction. Most of the user, uh, and institutional are using uh, that method because it truly helps you to eliminate that one single point of failure. And one of the huge advantages is that kind of like, it made a bit the conversation around cold and hot a bit more obsolete because now the way you can safe keep fund with MPC solution, it's already much more secure than what we used to have with just one key, which was on the server and online. I think uh, we have another question from Peter, but before I ask that, uh, Christoph, was there anything you wanted to add? All good. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, I'll read out Peter's question then. Um, as both Nuri and Solaris Digital Assets have customers within Europe, how happy are you with the German crypto regulation, for example, demanding a license? And do you think it is beneficial for Germany's crypto environment? I have a very, um, a very clear opinion on that and what is it always? Um, I think to have this business started in Germany is in the long run a huge advantage. Um, and the, the German regulatory environment is always from also, especially from the outside, seen a little bit as too prudent, conservative, moving too slow. Uh, actually, what we currently see is that the German parliament plus regulator moves faster on on on, on this uh, whole blockchain scene and um and this development as, as everybody would have thought before or would would expect um i was on the bafin conference two and a half years ago and there were meeting um, there were like some breakout rooms and workshops on decentralized exchanges there were some the, the workshop was guided by bafin guys two and a half years ago i didn't know what a, what a dex is at that time um, so these guys are quite ahead. Um, and yes, you need licenses in Germany. I see that as a, as a plus because um, again, for, for the case we have, as I said at the beginning, to bring mainstream customers who have, who are super like this, this shiny nugget cryptocurrencies. I also would like to have one, but then there is this dangerous river I have to cross, basically go into that opportunity area. And, and, and we need to take the hurdles away. And safety issues and uh, issues of, is my money safe? Is the, the thing I'm doing, is that covered somehow? Is the party I'm interacting with, are these scammers? Are these real? So obviously uh, a German license is a huge seal of trust. This is like a huge signal for customers. Okay, I can relax. I can do this with my money. Um, nothing will happen. There's somebody looking over that. And yes, that has a price. Um, uh, and I would even say some of our competitors were faster in the early stage and, and scaling faster, had more money for product and fancy stuff and marketing money than we had. But I very much believe that on the long run to build a sustainable business who is very successful at the long run, 
Germany was actually a great point to start this. And um, the German regulation, kind of my observation of how the, uh, the environment moves right now, will be also a blueprint throughout Europe. So it doesn't help you to sit in Malta on your little bit looser restrictions. You will need at a later stage to move to, to, to a rather German uh, environment. And so we already have that built in, could be at the long run really an hour advantage. Yeah, I think could not agree more uh, with Christophe on, on that one, right? Uh, I think, you know, most of the people in the crypto space, you know, are not against regulation. Actually, a lot of a lot of people just want clear regulations and now they can know what are the rules and, you know, what are the rules we need to play by. Um, and as Christophe mentioned as well, I think the, the when the regulation is constructive uh, and, you know, uh, create an environment where people can start to build businesses without having the fear and like, you know, at any moment of time, this will become illegal and they can shut it down. And I think this has bring a lot of credibility towards the crypto slash digital assets industry. For example, in Germany, now there was recently the regulation that actually uh, funds can invest uh, in crypto, right? So that started with that regulation coming from the MLD5 directive at the European level, where then, you know, to be a crypto custodian, you need to have a license. And we can see that this has ripple effect on other parts of the industry and the industry is growing as a whole. Um, so I think, you know, when you have clarity, I think it helps uh, and the country, which will be, I think, the, the smartest will be the ones that, you know, will provide clear uh, regulations and people can uh, rely on a uh, trust and, and build upon. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, it was uh, quite helpful. Yeah, thank you both for that. And thank you, Peter, for the question. I think that's a very interesting um, segue that we went down there. So uh, I think it's a very, very interesting conversation. Slightly on a different tangent. Um, Let's move back a little bit to the background steps that are occurring when a new customer creates a custodial wallet in the app. Uh, Christoph, would you mind elaborating a little bit? What is happening actually in the background? Oh, that is a good question. Which I, uh, losing my co uh, going a little bit out of my comfort zone here, being the business. I can help. Guy. I can help you with this. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, Alexi, do you you do first, and then I can perhaps add a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I can get started um, a little bit. So typically, you know, what we offer at Solar Digital Asset is an API, uh, and then Bitvala has built their own application on top of that, which includes a different component. Uh, but typically, the first step, you know, is you having a wallet when you uh, complete your KYC process with Bitvala, uh, and then you finally have your KYC completed and you see you have your bank account, which is already at disposal with the great uh, UX of Nuri. And then you will also automatically have uh, a crypto wallet, which is available. Uh, so in that regard, you know, everything is seamlessly integrated for you as an end user. You don't have to worry about the KYC data is uh, processed by Solaris Bank and Solaris Digital Assets, uh, and a wallet will automatically uh, be uh, created for you. The next step will be, do you want to deposit crypto uh, into that wallet? Uh, so for that, you will need an address. Uh, so therefore, uh, you know, we can generate an address for you. You know, you ju just as a click of a button within the app, which is fully seamless. And then uh, you will see uh, an address uh, in your user interface, which will be generated via the Solaris Digital Asset API. Uh, if you send some funds, you know, we are listening to the blockchain, we will detect that transaction and this will update your balance. Um, and I think the last step, or actually there's two more steps as you can do, uh, will be either to withdraw your fund. Let's say you want to send your fund to someone uh, to someone else, uh, then you know a blockchain transaction will be created to broadcast your fund. We will obviously ask uh, for your approval uh, through the Bitvala uh, interface in a very seamless way, uh, which is very similar to the user experience that you will get on the on the banking side. And ultimately, probably one of the most interesting one is you know how do you buy and sell cryptocurrency uh, within the app? So with the great uh, Bitvala offering as well, you can also from the bank account purchase crypto, which will be seamlessly deposited on your. Uh, on your wallet. So that would be kind of like as a starter in a nutshell. I don't know, Christophe, if, uh, if you want to add anything on, on that. No, I, th I think that the importance here um, really is for the customer, again, to be really convenient that we, um, as, as the, the two service providers involved, share a lot of data in the background. We make the process as seamless as possible. Um, we update each other. So 
and and this is uh, this is not so uh, self evident so if you have a relationship in the uh, I come back always to this old world where i also worked before so when you ha have um, when you hold shares in 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 with you, with your bank so meaning they have perhaps a service partner custodian bank then it can really very often happen that you get letters from the one and the other, and then the one needs an update on your address, and also the other party needs needs stuff from you and uh, tax numbers, and this is all very clunky. Uh, still is uh, after 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 this system basically had decades to optimize itself, and it still feels like is this true? And you get letters about uh, stuff happening in your in your in your shared depo, uh, depot, and you think, what what exactly is that? And why do I get that? So um, I think what we have built here, obviously, is an interface uh, for the customer, which is like just storing value. I just want to be invested, hold it there, and don't care about it. And I think um, yeah, it, so, so far, um, that is um, a huge step forward. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> Very step forward. Um, Sasha, you had another question, which I will uh, read out. Um, on the generation of the public-private key generation, um, the key ceremony process, is that differently handled across crypto custodians or similar, more or less? Yes, yeah, so I, I can take that one. Uh, it is actually quite different depending of like you know which technology do you do you use, right? So we were mentioning you know you could have a single key, you could have a multi-sig. Uh, you could be using uh, Secret Chamber or you could be using M uh, MPC technology, could be on the core storage, could be, you know, online. Uh, so uh, depending on which technology you are using, the process might differ a little bit. I think what is common and similar across uh, all the key ceremony, at least that's what we hope for, uh, is then like, you know, there's a high level of security and integrity, uh, which is uh, needed on this ceremony. That's why, for example, on our side, uh, we had external auditor uh, which represent internal control plus our side based security team um, and different you know control measures which were in place uh, but so you know they differ a little bit from uh, there's different way to do it and depending of how custodians have keep your key uh, they might change a little bit yeah christoph did you want to add anything to this um, um, I think the internal control procedures are really an important issue here and co comes back to regulation. So there is like from traditional banking of highly or perhaps even over-regulated space, there is a lot of experience coming from that area on how to build internal control procedures, internal processes, which have flows and, and responsibilities and, and how also this, this can be audited and this is translatable to, um, to a crypto custodian who needs to store in a safe way funds because we're not only talking about external crime, you also need to prevent any fraudulent internal case. And um, so, so there are a lot of learnings you can, you can translate. So the, uh, the, our colleagues from Solaris Bank running a bank, I think it's not, uh, it's not a coincidence that Solaris Bank is running a digital assets um, subsidiary Alexis representing it. I've seen Julian, Julian here also representing it in, in, in the audience um, that they can easily translate these uh, into the digital, in the fully digital era and, and the digital asset space. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in that regard, I think one more thing to add is you have all this you know, uh, experience from the, from the banking sector, but I think what is quite unique with Solaris Bank is at first we are a tech company. Uh, and therefore, you know, being able to design these processes, but also understanding the cybersecurity risk and how to make it efficient, uh, it combined you know, kind of like the best of both worlds in that regard where we have the experience on like, you know, the traditional banking side, but also as a tech company, uh, we can translate that into the, the crypto and digital asset space. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, I have one more final question before I'll open the floor to a more interactive Q&A. Um, Christoph, I will address this to you. Uh, what are the advantages for Nuri partnering with a custody, custody provider such as uh, Solaris Digital Assets, maybe versus just building your own? Buy versus build decision. That's a daily management decision for nearly every process you're having. You're always 
um, uh, weighting the options, uh, do I find a solution on the market? If you talk, if you talk about marketing uh, tooling, do you, do you do this internally or is there a SaaS solution out there you can integrate? Um, same here, obviously way bigger buy or build um, a decision. But yes, um, we have been also asked by investors. We have looked into that ourselves. Would it make sense as being a crypto company, also coming from like really crypto roots, uh, being blockchain experts, do we want to build something like this on our own? Or is there a solution we want to trust and, and integrate as a business partner? And as I think I hinted on it before. In this market, there is huge economies of scale. Um, that is... Um, um, storing of assets and, and safekeeping them. There's a lot of processes and a lot of things around it, which are huge one-time investments, but later they are scaling perfectly. And this is a typical market where you have uh, B2B providers who are running in the background of, um, of rather front-end orientated services um, like ours. So for us, this was a clear, this is a clear decision to, um, to use a service provider. We see this market, the crypto custodian market, as I said before, the traditional custodian market for securities, where at the end in Germany, you have five, six names, nothing else is left over. Um, this is also the market for, for digital assets. Um, and there, there will be a continuous investment in cybersecurity in processes. And again, like these are all one-time investments, but they are, if you do them for a hundred million uh, in assets or a hundred billion or trillion, so um, it scales very well. Great. And uh, if you don't mind, um, Alexis, would you like to add anything to that? I think it was very well summarized by, uh, by Christophe here, you know, like, um, what we try to do is to enable our partner to do, you know, what they do best and for them to focus on their USP and to remove the, uh, the complexity away uh, so that they can focus on their end user and adding value. Um, and I think, you know, there are some parts of the, of, of the product that like, you know, uh, you definitely <clears throat> want to own like the front end interface and like the product instead and some part of the engine. There are products and you probably want to rely on a, you know, a third party uh, to do it for you uh, in that regard. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, you know, perfect uh, example of a great uh, collaboration, which is at the end of the day, adding value to the market and adding value uh, to the end user, which are getting a very great product um, at the end. Thank you for elaborating on that further. I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, we already have some questions in the chat, so I will uh, read them out um, and start the Q&A. If anybody wants to ask the question themselves, of course, also uh, maybe raise your hand or give me some sort of indication so that I can uh, also call on you uh, after I've read out the, the first questions we have here in the chat. Um, so we have the first question with a follow-on question. I will read both in one go. Firstly, how easy or difficult is it to change custodians? Is it a safe process? And current offline processes for investment assets seem extremely difficult. So is it possible to change offline to digital assets and how does that work? Maybe to, to answer very briefly then, Christophe, I can let, let it to you on that one. Uh, is, you know, I mean, moving from one custodian to the other, right? I mean, that's the beauty of blockchain. You don't have to move paper from one to the other or to do like a migration, you know, you just have to do a blockchain transaction and now your funds all of a sudden are in a new uh, custodian. What you have to take into consideration, right? Is like, how do you build your processes and your integration around that, uh, which then this is dependent, you know, to each organization, how do they uh, take care of that? But that's the beauty of blockchain, right? There's one open public blockchain, uh, oh, like, you know, you have one open uh, protocol, for example, on the Bitcoin network, and you can just do one transaction to move your funds around. And you don't have siloed system, which make it impossible then to do this, like, you know, uh, large scale uh, transaction. So I would say, you know, much better than what you can do in the, uh, in the old world in that regard. Let me perhaps take the second part of the question. So what do you do with your offline securities and the non really full digital um, investments you have in, uh, in, in securities, shares, ETFs, whatever? Um, that is an issue. That is, um, there is, there's a great infrastructure now to store digital assets and to trade digital assets, but 
a lot of assets are not on the blockchain yet. So um, the, the, the leap, um, the huge leap we now need is that the underlying assets a share, a piece of real estate, um, a piece of, a, of an investment fund, uh, a share of Daimler, a share of Deutsche Bank, that needs to be available on a fully digital environment to actually make use of this way to, to interact with crypto custodians, digital asset custodians, and these products, and to take out the complexity for the customer. I, I, I very deliberately made these examples before. So if you are holding like shares of, of Deutsche Bank, you get letters, um, invitation to the, to the yearly assembly. Um, if there's a share split, you get, if, if, if an investment fund changes name, it's the the, the whatever i shares 40 uctis 570k what and then it's, it has a new name what i don't know even the old name what's not the new name why do i get this letter um why do i have to fill out stuff send it per mail back and all of this um what what we still have when we invest in things in 10 years we will not have that anymore that is that is going away because the the usability is so so bad the costs are so high even like after 50 years of optimization actually this whole asset management and and, and, and storage is really inefficiently cost and expensive in comparison to how how cryptocurrencies show how it's possible so the innovation of bitcoin and 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 and, and with it the blockchain shows how easy it can be to store and to transact um, and to transfer value and if the value is one Bitcoin, the underlying value, or if the underlying value represents a house here in Berlin or a share of time, that doesn't matter. It is just as advantages. And, um, but again, there is a leap still to do. Um, the regulator and the, um, and the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the legal environment is moving into that direction. It takes a little bit of time, but it's actually, I'm very optimistic. It's moving faster than we think. Thank you for that. I'm I'm very impressed with the with the questions. I think they're really good, really informative. Um, drive a very interesting conversation forward. So thanks to everyone, and uh, please keep them coming. Um, James has one, and um, it's an interesting one. I think quite a, a topical one that's often in the news um, and being debated. So one key criticism of Bitcoin is the environmental impact caused by the computational efforts. What role can custodians play in mitigating this in the future? Yeah, so I, I can take that one as a as a custody, as a custody provider here. Uh, so um, I think it's a very good question. You know, what you have to make the difference, you know, and look at it is like yes, there is an environmental at play, but I think you have to put it into perspective. Uh, so I think a lot of the criticism which is being done so far and you know it's moving things into the right direction because people are thinking about how to optimize uh, the overall energy consumption of this value very valuable innovation was two things and like you know bitcoin is just not very helpful and therefore it's just consuming energy uh, in a wasteful way uh, but in that regard you could think about okay is it wasteful as well to be you know um, having an electric car you know because this is something which is you know also consuming energy which you do not use in general is the, the answer is no, because right now the alternative is to drive a regular car, which is even more polluting, right? So then how do you compare Bitcoin? You know, do you compare Bitcoin to just like the pure nominal consumption or do you compare it to what is it replacing and the value which is bringing? Um, and when it comes to the you know, environmental impact, there's still some, a lot of progresses you know, that can be made. Right now, we are speaking about the settlement layer on the Bitcoin network, which is yeah, quite intensive because it's made for the security. But we see there's you know, additional layer which are being built on that, which would be much more energy efficient. Uh, and it's just the beginning of the field, right? Remember the internet like you know, uh, 20 years ago, it was not as efficient as it is now. But you know, the, the beauty of that industry, it's innovating so fast and you know you see improvement you already see already see you know of a blockchain which are using you know different type of like uh, computation method uh, for the for the mining uh, and i'm sure you know uh, bitcoin will also uh, not maybe uh, not move into a different um, uh, not move to proof of stake but maybe you know via the layer to a network be much more efficient uh, and then the core bitcoin protocol would just be used you know for like uh, you know 
hard settlement where you need the security and therefore you need that uh, energy consumption to move that funds around. So I think the you know environmental impact is always a good thing and it's always super important and we're having that uh, conversation. Uh, but I think we need to put it into perspective. Now the role of a custodian in that, it's quite of a good one. We are not uh, minor, right? So we are just like processing transaction in that regard. Uh, we are not directly mining. However, what we already do, you know, from a custodian perspective is sometimes we do off-chain transactions, which are not on-chain. And therefore we enable, for example, you know, uh, the Vala in that use case to enable the end user to settle without having to do a transaction on-chain, which is reducing, you know, this uh, transactions and you have to do off-chain. So that's one way, you know, custodian uh, can play a role and somewhat being a layer two kind of like centralized uh, entity. Uh, but you know, overall, the hope is that the the, the network will keep to the protocol will keep to uh, improve and become more and more efficient uh, over time. Perhaps a last last thing I want to add um, on the whole Bitcoin energy discussion. I'm personally very concerned about the climate change, um, and it doesn't help to say, yeah, but what, what about the streaming services? What about the traditional banks? What about the gold industry? They also um, consume a lot of uh, energy and are not uh, and, and emitting CO2. And um, that doesn't help. Um, Bitcoin needs to become more efficient. I like what, what, what Alexis said. We are very early in this technology. It is, uh, the, the good analogy is always also the steam engine, which was very, very dirty at its very beginning to, to produce a little bit of energy. And now we have obviously found ways to way better produce also energy and the Bitcoin network needs to move to more um, regenerative energy. Um, there perhaps needs to be incentives more. And I think the public discussion is one of these incentives because it's moving the price and the miners also are looking on the price. So um, public awareness, I think not, don't, uh, don't point fingers on others. Don't point on the custodians. What can they do? What can Bidwala do? What can Nuri do? I think the public awareness um, and pointing it out, that helps because it puts pressure on those who, are, who can influence it. Yeah, maybe one interesting thought as well you could, you could think about is like maybe actually crypto is going you know, to empower and drive the adoption of renewable energy, right? Because you could think about you know, solar panels which are you know, uh, collecting energy and now instead of like, you know, having this excess, you could be, you know, uh, mining and directly, you know, being paid uh, for that activity. So maybe in, in some way, you know, it could be maybe a win-win situation uh, in that regard to also drive uh, renewable. As we see, it is a very innovative space where people are moving very quickly. If you don't mind, we have one more question um, that uh, we could, uh, we could take, so hopefully you have a few more minutes for us. Um, Sasha has another question, which uh, reads, where, so do you see the main challenges for the new crypto custodians to scale up on more traditional services as offered today, such as asset servicing, reporting, collateral, staking, besides pure safekeeping services when focusing on institutional client segments with global portfolios and compliance checks, such as white addresses, callbacks, et cetera. Yeah, happy to, take, to to start with that one as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously, I think just like safekeeping the asset, you know, it's just like one minor, uh, I mean, one very important actually service that needs to be done very properly to safekeep, but it does not stop there, right? There is a lot of like uh, services that you can offer, especially when it comes to institutional and business client, uh, which have different needs. Um, I think the space is still quite early, but you see the development where you start with custody, they start the option to buy and sell. Uh, but then, you know, you have also a use case for serving institutional where you need to do some type of like uh, prime brokerage services where you can uh, lend asset to get some yield. Uh, or also, as you mentioned, uh, staking, you know, where you can provide yield product uh, to this institutional investor. And that's where the field becomes super exciting, right? Uh, so you have like DeFi protocol, you have staking services. And now in an environment in Europe where we have negative interest rate. Uh, you obviously have different risk profile in this type of product, uh, but you can also generate yield uh, for institutional client, which is quite interesting. And you know, if you make some analogy to the old world, you know, I started my career in derivative actually back in the day, and I remember we were selling product with like you know complex uh, credit default swap on some institution or derivative, and then. The institutional investor, the challenge they had was, you know, how to understand this product and how to understand the risks and they are getting to get that yield. 
Now what you, I think the future is, they're not going to look into what is the derivative about, but they're going to understand what is my smart contract risk on that, uh, on that product, for example, you know, to be interacting with that one specific DeFi protocol, or what is my protocol risk, you know, to be staking on that specific protocol, is that protocol secure or not? Um, and that's actually quite of an exciting uh, way to look at it, because at the end of the day, institutional are looking of where they can generate yield. Uh, and if this is, you know, something which become more mature, uh, they would definitely look for that. Christoph, anything to add? No, uh, that's a question to the custodian, all good. Wonderful. No more questions came in. So um, I encourage if, if anyone wants a quick answer to something, uh, you have a few seconds to, to type. Um, but since nothing came in for a while now, four minutes, I think we are at the end. Um, thank you both very, very much. I think it was a really interesting discussion. I definitely learned something. And um, yeah, I, uh, I hope we do this again sometime soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Manam, and thank you, Christoph, for joining as well. And thank you, everybody, for, for your time and the great question. Have a nice evening, everyone. Have thank a nice you. evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.